Okay, so moving right along in um, our Tangerine um, book study. Um, I think we're on week um, five. Are we on week five? Let me double check. What week are we on? I always just go under the classwork tab. So I think we're on week four. We're on week four. Okay, so we're reading 160 to 170 in the book. 99 on the PDF. So lots of weird things are going on. You got Joey's acting not the best. Uh, he's getting mad at Paul, call, blaming his, blaming him for coming to Tangerine Middle School. Um, and then you have this issue of there was a homeowners association meeting at the, at the Fisher's house, and there's a lot going on. There's the muck fire. Now they, um, they tried to put out the muck fire and they flooded it with water and it created a mosquito issue because Florida is hot and muggy. So they have a mosquito issue, so now um, somebody, they had to pay somebody to come in and spray the neighborhood with pesticide. And then there are certain houses on certain streets that have a terrible um, uh, insect problem, and they're having to be tented and fumigated with um, chemicals to kill all the bugs, termites, roaches, whatever is uh, in the house. And when those houses are tented, there are robberies taking place. And then there's this man-made um, like reservoir, and um, they put these fancy Japanese fish in it called koi, and now the koi are, are they're all gone. So there's all these things going on, and Paul's just you know working on his project with um, Tino and Teresa and Henry D. And so he also saw his dad made this file for Eric's college offers. So a lot of like weird stuff is going on. So we're gonna start with Thursday, October 5th, 99 on the PDF. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Joey didn't come to school today. I wasn't surprised. I know exactly where he was. He was in the lake, he was in the office at Lake Windsor Middle School re-enrolling. It's the right thing for him to do. It's the right place for him to be. I never should have talked Joey into coming to Tangerine. He doesn't fit in here. I should have seen that. Joey's not me. Joey fits in with his family. He fits in with his friends. He fits in with Lake Windsor Downs. That's where he belongs. That's where he is now. And that's all there is to say about it. Right before science class began, I went up to Teresa and handed her six pages of research. She, she seemed pleasantly surprised. I said, so what's up with Tino? She said, not much, and started to look at my papers. Does the coach know that he got suspended? Yeah, I guess so. Everyone else, know, Everybody else knows. Is he going to miss tomorrow's game? No, he's coming back tomorrow. Yeah, I heard he got three days. Louise went in and talked to Dr. Johnson. She said that since Tino didn't actually hit anybody, she'd reduce his time out to one day. Oh, that's cool. Teresa stopped thumbing through my report. She looked me right in the eye like she'd never had before. Yeah, look, uh, Paul Fisher, you got to understand one thing. You can't come in here and start talking about Louise any way that you like. Luis means too much to us. I nodded quickly. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Tino and Victor, they don't play that kind of stuff. I told them last night that they should leave you alone, but you better tell your friend to keep out of the way. I thought about that. I don't think he goes to school here anymore, and I don't think he counts me as his friend. Not anymore. Well, I don't know anything about that. I'm just telling you what I'm telling you. She pulled a piece of white paper out of her back pocket. Here. This is a map to our house. Henry's coming over after practice to meet Luis. If you want to meet him, you can come too. I stared at the map and at the large black X marking their house. As coolly as I could, I said, so what about Tino? What do you mean? He won't be mad if I come? No, why should he? I shrugged, you know, the stuff with Joey. You're not Joey, are you? No, but is he mad about get getting suspended? You're not the one who got him suspended, are you? I shook my head and said no, but I thought to myself, not this time anyway. I walked over to talk to Henry D, and we wound up working out a great plan. Henry's brother was going to drive him from Tandry Middle School to Teresa's house, come back to get him, and then drive over to Lake Windsor Downs to do a job. Henry said that he and his brother would be pleased to drop me off right at my door. I called Mom and explained the plan. She sounded doubtful, but she agreed to let me do it. At practice, the coach put me in Tino's position. I played poorly, but nobody seemed to care. It was just temporary. Tino would be back tomorrow. After practice, I followed Henry D. to the parking lot. We walked up to the small blue pickup truck and climbed in. Henry said, this is Paul. This is my brother, Wayne. 
Wayne Dilks. I know him right away, the fireman, the young guy who came to our who had come to our house about the muck fire. He gave me a friendly hi, but I don't think he recognized me. Anyway, he didn't say anything as we drove east toward the groves, listening to a country music station. Soon we were flying past perfect rows of citrus trees, and that glorious scent was in the air. I saw the, a large wooden sign that said Tomas Cruz Groves Nursery. Wayne slowed to five miles per hour and turned right onto a dirt road. We bumped along past an oblong pond, 50 yards across, ringed all around with tall cattails. Behind the pond, on higher ground, was a grove of trees, hundreds of them, all about 10 feet high and 6 feet wide. Water sprinklers rose tall among the green trees like skinny metal weeds. We bumped to the left toward several buildings, a house, a separate garage, a small shed, and another strange-looking building. The house was large, two stories high, with old shade trees around it. It appeared to be built of cement blocks covered with a kind of mustard-colored stucco. We rolled in a cloud of dust past the house, pulled up next to the classic green floor, and climbed out in front of that other building. Wayne said, I'll see y'all in an hour, and backed out, leaving us standing before one of the strangest structures I had ever seen. I have ever seen. It looked like a gigantic tin can that had been cut in half lengthwise and then pressed down into the ground. I asked Henry, what is this thing? It's a Quonset hut. They had a lot of them left over after World War II. Some of the citrus farmers bought them up cheap as war surplus. So you guys know what a Quonset hut looks like. So when you drive um, through Discovery Bay and you go through, you have, like you come into Discovery Bay and you have that like uh, market, it's red, and then you keep, you go around the bend and when you turn left to go to Port Townsend, there's a Quonset hut. It does, it looks like a long tin can. It's just like a semicircle. There's a lot of them in uh, where I grew up in, in Moses Lake. A lot of farmers bought them cheap just like this and they use them to, for their, um, to store all their stuff to have a farm. So you know what a Quonset hut looks like. Yeah, did you find that out in your research? Yes, I did. Henry knocked on the wooden door of the Quonset hut. I looked up and figured that the door was six feet tall and the hut was 12 feet tall at its highest point. At its lowest points, the end stuck right into the ground. Gino opened the door and said, Yo, Henry D. Then he turned back inside without acknowledging me. I followed Henry and Tino to the far end of the Quonset hut, about 20 yards down through the cool, dark, windowless building. The sides where the metal ceiling curved down to the cement floor were jammed with wooden crates, sprinkler heads, wheelbarrows, and all kinds of equipment. We joined Teresa and Luis at the rear door. Teresa pointed at us and said to him, That's, that one's Henry D. The other one's Paul Fisher. Luis smiled. He had large teeth inside a large head. He had a strange shape too, bony and muscular at the same time. His arms, his legs, his whole body were like thick rope. Luis said, Good to see you guys. His voice was soft and seemed accented more than Tino's or Teresa's. He walked ahead of us, limping as if his left knee would not bend. He led us out of the Quonset hut toward the weather-beaten trees on a north hill on a hill north of the house. Louise stopped about five rows in, pointed around him, and said, This is a grove. We grow a fruit here called the Cleopatra tangerine, and we sell it to citrus packers and juice companies. Our family has done that for 45 years now. Louise doubled back, and we followed. We turned left at the hut and soon came to an open space as long as a soccer field, but square in shape. Here the trees were like babies, only a foot and a half high, and space not much more than a foot apart. There must have been a thousand of them. Louis sat down next to one of the baby trees, so we all copied him. He said, look around you. This is a nursery. The purpose of a nursery is not to grow fruit. It is to grow trees. Then we sell these trees to fruit grow growers. Louis placed a long finger at the base of the baby tree. This part of the tree is called the root stalk. It is the root and trunk of a rough lemon tree. Believe it or not, every type of tree that we produce here begins its life as a rough lemon tree. His finger rose six inches to the knobby beginning of a branch. At this spot, we cut a slit into the rough lemon tree and set in a new type of bud inside, set a new type of bud inside and close the slip up with tape. Now we have turned the tree into something else, perhaps a Valencia orange tree or a red ruby grapefruit tree the new bud that we grafted onto the rootstock is called a scion. The word scion means like child or descendant of the tree. Luis pointed his arm back to the tall trees. 
check this out. A sky can be any kind of citrus that you want. Orange, grapefruit, lemon, lime. They And they can all be growing on the same tree at the same time. That means on one little tree, you could have a branch of white grapefruit, a branch of red kumquats, and a branch of green limes, like some kind of Frankenstein fruit tree, all stitched together. He caressed the trunk of the baby tree. The rough lemon is totally worthless in the supermarket, and yet there is no more valuable tree out here in the nursery. Louise got to his feet, flushed with feeling. He pointed to the thousand baby trees before us. If you look out here, you'll see that all these trees are the same. On each, there's one sky engrafted onto a rough lemon rootstock. That sky is a new type of tangerine called the Golden Dawn. Louise stared with us at the field that he had created. Then he turned and led us back through the rows of adult trees. He pointed out different types of citrus trees, including some Frankenstein experiments of his own. He answered many questions for our report. All too quickly, we were back at the Quonset hut. Henry D. looked out the door and announced, Wayne's waiting. I walked up to Louise and offered my hand to shake. He took it in a powerful rope-like grip. I said, thank you. I'm really interested in this stuff. He answered, then you should come again. I said, I'd definitely like to. I turned toward Teresa and Tino. See you guys later. Teresa waved. Tino acted like he didn't hear. I followed Henry D. through the door and then stopped short. There attached to the back of Wayne's pickup truck was a short trailer. It had a fat, heavy generator mounted on it with a large fan and a spray nozzle on either side. I said, what on earth's that? Wayne answered cheerfully. It's a sprayer for y'all's mosquitoes. We bumped along with the sprayer behind us all the way to Lake Windsor Downs. As soon as we turned into the entrance, Wayne spotted the blue tents along Joey Street. Look at that now, he said. Y'all are having a regular ten plagues of Egypt over here, aren't you? Yeah, I said, ten and counting. How many houses got termites? Looks like that whole street has them, all along the west side. Then that's where they buried the citrus trees, he said. This is a grove, you know. Yeah, so I've heard. It was groves all around here. When they cleared this land for houses, they just set fire to all the trees and plowed them under. You see how that whole blue tent street seems to be on a hill? Yeah, that hill's made of dead trees, dead tangerine trees. Termites live in all that wood under the ground, but they gotta come up to the surface to get water. That's where your problems start. If the wood in your house is in the way, they start eating that. I said, you can stop them though, right? You can kill them. You can call the Orkin Army or something. Wayne shook his head. You can't stop them. You can't put a barrier around your house. That's about it. But you can't stop them from eating wood any more than you can stop that muck fire from burning or them mosquitoes from sucking blood. We were at the house. I said, here it is. I got out and looked at the spraying rig. You guys going to turn this thing on now? Wayne smiled. Yeah, we're going to let her rip. We'll kill some of them mosquitoes for you anyway. So thanks for the ride, Wayne. See you, Henry. Henry Wayne... Wayne waved. He reached under his seat and handed something to Henry. Then in the same motion, they both pulled on black rubber gas masks over their faces. They sat there for a minute, looking like a pair of ant men who had stolen a truck. Then Wayne got out, walked back, and pulled the starter cord on the generator. I watched as the rig coughed and sputtered to life. Then I backed away and hurried inside. I dropped my stuff in the alcove and went into the kitchen for a drink. Out of the corner of my eye, I detected two people in motion, and I heard the Poof, poof, poof sound. I knew that Eric and Arthur were practicing in the back. Would they stop when they smelled the insecticide? I got a soda and stood at the breakfast bar, waiting to see what they would do. I saw a billowing white cloud enter the backyard like an angel of death. It came from the right to the left in white waves and quickly filled up the whole yard. But as I watched the scene, it happened again, just like in Houston, just like at the gray wall. A feeling came over me, overpowering me, like I had to remember something, whether I wanted to or not. I stared hard into the backyard. First I could see Eric and Arthur, then I couldn't see them, then I could see them, then I couldn't, and I remembered. Our backyard in Huntsville, Mom and Dad were standing in front of me. Dad was directing Eric to move in a circle around and behind me. Dad was saying, okay, Eric, pretend that Paul is in the center of an imaginary clock and that I'm standing here in the six o'clock position. I want you to stand at the 12 o'clock position right behind him. Good. Now move to the 11 o'clock position. Then he said to me, Paul, can you see Eric? I said, no, I can't see him. Okay, Eric, move to 10 o'clock. Paul, can you see him? 
No, I can't see him. Move to the nine o'clock. I can't see him. I can't see him. Mom broke in. It's okay, honey. It's okay. She said to Dad, There, I told you. The problem is with this peripheral vision. Suddenly I felt the hot breath of a predator on my neck. I screamed in terror. Eric laughed and ran over to Mom and Dad. He had snuck up, behind, snuck up on me from behind, from somewhere back around 10 o'clock. Dad snapped at him. Eric, cut that out. Are you here to help us, help us or not? I remember that I started to cry in the middle of that pretend clock, but Mom and Dad did not notice. They were arguing about my eyes or about my glasses. Mom finally said, well, it won't hurt to try, will it? I'm taking him back there tomorrow to see what they can do. And she did. That was when I got my new glasses. That was when I started to see better. From that day on, I could see things that they could not. I could see Eric posing in front of them in the shining light of the football dream. And I could see Eric lurking behind me in the shadows of the clock. I'm going to get that for my how Paul's changing. Uh, Thursday, November 2nd. I used to be aware of every, every hour and every day, but now with soccer games and football games and school and cross-curricular projects, the whole, whole chunks of time fly by, and I'm amazed at what hour it is. Sometimes I'm amazed at what day it is. The last four weeks have been like that. They've gone by in a blur, and it's not just me. Every member in our family is now so busy that we don't even eat meals together anymore, but I'm not complaining. I guess none of us are. We're all doing what we expected to do in Tangerine. We're all becoming big fish in this little pond. Dad is now firmly in command as the Director of Civil Engineering for Tangerine County. Old Charlie Burns didn't survive the avalanche of bad publicity, lawsuits and criminal charges being hurled at him. He died of a heart attack in his lawyer's office. Dad didn't even go to his funeral. Mom is now the head of the Architectural Committee, a block captain for the Neighborhood Watch Patrol, and the person most likely to succeed Mr. Costello as president of the Homeowners Association. No surprises there. Mom knows what she wants for Lake Windsor Downs. What are the news in football? Eric Fisher's fortunes have changed big time. In four weeks, he's gone from local joke to local hero as the place kicker for the Lake Windsor High School High Seagulls. He is now always surrounded by kids who I suppose look up to him. I guess people see what they want to see. Eric kicked field goals of 12 and 25 yards in a 20 to zero win over Crystal River. Then he made one from 37 yards to win the Gulf County game 10 to seven. The following week, he was on the front page of the Tangerine Times sports section for making kicks of 40 and 45 yards to beat Flagler six to zero. Yesterday, he missed from 50 yards, but he hit from 30 and 38 in a 20 to 14 win over Suwanee. Everyone in Tangerine County knows him now, or they think they do. And what about the other member of the family, the other athlete in the family? The Tangerine Middle School War Eagles have won seven games in a row, and I have played in all seven games. I even started two games at fullback after Shonder collided with Dolly in practice and wrenched Dolly's back. I played all 90 minutes. In, other, in the other five games, I went in as a sub for either Victor or Maya in the second half. By then, we already had enough goals to beat most of our opponents, 10-0 over St. Anthony's, 8-0 over Heritage Baptist, 3-0 over De Leon, 4-0 over Seminole, 7-0 over Highland Park, 4-0 over Cortez, and 7-0 over Palmetto in a rematch at our home field. Those are the statistics of this soccer season, but I have to describe the feeling that this has given me. It's not enough to say that we have won seven soccer games in a row. It's how we've done it that's so extraordinary. The War Eagles have set out on a bloody rampage through the county, We've destroyed every enemy. We've laid waste to their fields and their fans. There is fear in their eyes when we come charging off our bus, whooping our, our war cry. They are beaten by their own fear before the game even begins. This is a feeling that I have never known before. Anyway, I've never known it from this side of fear. Maybe I'm just a sub, maybe I'm just along for the ride, but this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. That's definitely going in my notes. Okay, carry on. See you tomorrow.